Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Allora, la registrazione è stata già avviata, eccoci. Bene, allora, eh, buongiorno, eh, direi benvenuti al secondo ciclo del, della serie di conferenze Cities of the World. Voi le avete forse viste eh, sul sito che abbiamo condiviso. L'anno scorso con Valentina abbiamo avviato questa, eh, questa consuetudine di invitare degli ospiti e chiedergli di parlare di, delle città in cui vivono o in cui lavorano, e parlandone naturalmente sotto molti aspetti. Uno degli aspetti è quello della storia della città, e oggi abbiamo un professore che insegna un dipartimento di, di storia dell'Università di Gothenburg, è un professore ordinario di archeologia, ma vedrete che ha anche una consuetudine con il nostro mondo, con il mondo dell'architettura e dell'urbanistica. Io l'ho conosciuto tra l'altro eh, online, è una cosa abbastanza nuova. Eh, ci siamo conosciuti durante un workshop quest'estate, eh, forse anche prima, in qualche altra ehm, attività organizzata online sempre, eh, che abbiamo fatto anche con Valentina Ciuffreda, eh, su Castelvecchio Calvisio, questo centro molto bello medievale eh, in Abruzzo. E, mh, abbiamo condiviso con il professor eh, Cornell, la pronuncia forse non è esatta, poi lo dirà lui. Eh, abbiamo condiviso molti, molti temi di, di, di lavoro durante il workshop, quindi insomma è nata una eh, collaborazione e l'ho invitato a fare questa lezione perché si trovava in Italia e, e lui sta facendo un, un giro tra Firenze e Roma. Allora, oggi parliamo appunto di Gothenburg, di questa città svedese, Abbiamo un ciclo di circa eh, nove lezioni, se non ricordo male, nove conferenze su molte città, da Londra, adesso abbiamo aggiunto, aggiunto anche Tokyo, ehm, e poi abbiamo città ehm, spagnole come Siviglia, abbiamo anche Helsinki, Finlandia, Helsinki, in the cycle, Helsinki, Helsinki, ecco vedi. Bisogna sempre sentire. E io adesso però vi presento il, il professor Cornell che insegna appunto all'Università di Gothenburg dagli anni 90. E ha anche fondato lui stesso alcuni corsi di studio, tra cui un importante master sui temi dell'archeologia. È stato relatore di 18 tesi di dottorato e ha lavorato a vario titolo con molti altri dottorandi, quindi molto attivo nel, nella ricerca di dottorato. Ha partecipato a congressi internazionali sui temi della didattica, in corsi di laurea magistrale e nei corsi di dottorato. Ha condotto diversi grandi progetti di scavo archeologico, molti in America Latina, lui ha un'esperienza lunga di, di lavoro in, in America Latina e, e quindi ha anche una certa familiarità con le lingue latine, per cui vi, vi capisce se vi parlate in italiano, quindi se qualcuno vorrà rivolgergli una domanda in italiano lo può fare. E, recentemente sta lavorando in un importante scavo nella sua città, appunto Gothenburg. Ha lavorato anche in Sicilia, in, campo scuola, in un campo scuola. Ha pubblicato molti articoli in riviste internazionali, in varie lingue. Si interessa molto dell'ambiente costruito, della città, del territorio, sia per gli aspetti formali, sia per le questioni socio-economiche. E come vi dicevo, lavora con gli architetti. Ad esempio, ha uh, collaborato con la, con la rete Architecture, Archaeology and Contemporary City Planning. È lì che ci siamo poi eh, incrociati. E, e sta lavorando su un libro insieme con l'architetto paesaggista svedese Anna Wynne Frank. Eh, grazie eh, per, per essere venuto. Now I switch to English for a brief introduction for, for Per. Uh, I was introducing your, your profile, but you understood my, my speech. Perfect. So, um, adesso direi eh, che potete anche chiudere le telecamere, ragazzi da, da casa, grazie. Ci sono ehm, diversi laureandi, no? come ti dicevo, oltre gli studenti del quarto anno che stanno facendo appunto questo corso di progettazione urbanistica, ci sono anche 
diversi laureandi che stanno facendo, preparando la tesi di laurea con me. Eh, adesso condivido lo schermo e dovremmo esserci per cominciare. Vedete la presentazione? La casa? Sì, prof. Sì, prof. Bene. Sì. Però perché non si vede qui? Si vede soltanto qui. Fatemi capire. Ecco. Così. Ok. So, uh, you can just use your, the arrows to go back and forth. Can Thank I, you. Can I signal you can... Uh, yes. Yeah. You, you, you need you need a laser pointer. Yeah. The star. The star. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well. Can you put, should you put your hand? <coughs> Or, yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. So I try to speak to that one. See. So I sit on this or that chair? No, oh, this one, because the, the camera for, yeah. the, for the guys at home. You can also use the mouse to, to, to go for to move, yeah. For, 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 but you have to go from this to this. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. I can use that. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, I see. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, welcome. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I was allowed to take this off. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I am uh, an archaeologist, actually, formally, uh, but I try to work more and more oriented at general questions related to built environment. Uh, today I have been asked to discuss the town of Gothenburg. Um, today it's the second largest town in Sweden, and uh, I've actually been brought up there, and I do work in that town. I have been at many other places uh, on the planet <laughs> doing different things in my life, but I return to this place frequently, and I <clears throat> work today at the University of Gothenburg. Um, if I can advance to the next. Yeah. Um, no. Hmm. Oops, uh, to see it there. It's stuck. Stuck there. Starting over, as you told me, <laughs> <laughs> it's always function. Now, oh, should work. Yeah, <laughs> I just used the uh, atoms. Yes. Um, yeah, here you you see a, a view of, of um, the, you could say the center of Gothenburg as it looked in 2010. But this is a town which is rapidly changing. So the bridge you see uh, at this uh, image, this bridge here does not exist anymore, but it's a new bridge which is fairly different in character. Uh, so that is a, a typical element of Gothenburg at present. It is changing considerably. But I'll start with a historical perspective. I think that is quite relevant when we discuss built environment, different types. Uh, and I will start with what was prior to Gothenburg in this particular landscape. We are talking about an area 
in Western Sweden today, uh, which is um, characterized by being uh, the area where a large river coming from northern areas in Sweden meet the Atlantic. And it is an area quite interesting actually because you have two different arms. Yeah. This southern one is what today is called the River Göta. Uh, it has the same name as the town, Göteborg. Uh, and uh, this other northern arm is simply, simply called the northern arm. Uh, today, the southern arm has the largest quantity of water. And the town of Gothenburg expands close to its estuary down here. But uh, the relation between these arms has changed considerably over time. It is not a given that the southern arm is the most important one. So this is a complex area of constant change in the sense of quaternary geology. Um, along the rivers, there is a lot of clay. Uh, we could discuss, this was below water 8,000 years ago, all this clay. Uh, and people lived on small islands in a completely different landscape. The water level uh, was 40 meters higher than today. In this landscape, 8,000 years ago, uh, hunter-gatherers thrived. It was a wonderful landscape for hunter-gatherers. Small hunting-gatherer, gathering communities, uh, had enormous resources at their disposal. This was rich in fish and small game. So uh, it was like a wonderful landscape for them. And they lived at small islands, traveling around among them, visiting one after the other. Uh, but then the water level started to go down. Uh, and uh, we have today a completely different landscape, the one you see on the map. Uh, and in this landscape, the clay has become a sort of particularity. So along these two arms, we have clay. These areas were traditionally not used for residential uh, units. You didn't build buildings in which you were supposed to live generally in this clay. If we look at early farming communities here or later in the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, they avoid this clay. Uh, and it is very easy to understand, the clay is not stable. So we have a lot of problems with landslides. Huge parts of clay moves down into the river. This occurs with regularity. These terrible uh, events. Uh, during the 20th century, we had two large landslides along the southern arm, one up here and one down here, which cost lives. People died, one in the 1940s and one in the 1970s, because from the end of the 19th century, it became a custom to use the clay areas for building residential units and even multifamily houses. Um, and strange enough, despite these terrible accidents in the uh, 19th and the 20th century, uh, they have not stopped using the clay areas for residential units. So this is a sort of imminent danger 
in present-day Gothenburg. And as you all understand, the present-day situation in which it is possible that the sea level will go up, um, increase the risk for new landslides. Despite this, the municipality and the county has a large program of intensifying the use of the areas close to the water. This is absurd. At the same time, as they speak about the need to be uh, aware of the climate change, etc., cetera, um, and have a lot of rhetorics on that, the major urban strategy is to intensify the use of the areas close to the water. But that is, in general, the clay areas. That is an, an absurdity. Um, in 1150, approximately, there was a major landslide. That is quite interesting. The geologists have demonstrated it very clearly. And that landslide occurred exactly here, where the two arms divide up here. It blocked, basically, water to go this way, down the southern arm. So all the water went down along the northern arm. Uh, shortly before that, a small town had been built on the clay areas along that northern arm. The town was called Kungahela. It's not a very important thing for you to remember. Kung is king. Hell is a hella, in this case, is, is a small piece of rock. It was a small piece of rock in the clay area in which the town was constructed. Uh, when this landslide occurred, it destroyed most of the town in 1150, approximately. Uh, so the evidence of that town is mostly found here, further down the river today, if you do uh, underwater archaeology. It was brought down there, bits of wood from the buildings, uh, ceramics, uh, and other materials from the town. From the 12th century? Yeah, exactly, the 12th century, 1150 approximately. It was a major catastrophe. Because this landslide occurred very quickly, so the other arm became a gigantic river suddenly during a, a couple of hours. It widened the northern arm completely uh, to become a sort of completely different landscape. Um, the northern arm became very important. Uh, in this period, there were emergent states. There was an emerging Norwegian state, an emerging Danish state, and a very much weaker emerging Swedish state in the 12th century. Uh, it was the Norwegian state who had founded the town that was destroyed by the flood. Uh, after this event, uh, the fact that this northern arm had become so wide became a sort of positive element for the Norwegian state. They could dominate all transports from upriver here out to the Atlantic. And they built a stone castle on an island, an island that had not been an island prior to the, the flood. This was the first large-scale stone structure ever made in Western Sweden. A gigantic investment for that period. That castle was in existence in 1250. But it was not used for long. Uh, slowly, the water started to pour down here again. And the states of Denmark and Sweden tried to help taking away and removing some of the clay in order to destroy the 
advantages that the Norwegian king had got, won through this uh, landslide. Um, so um, the southern arm started to bring some water again in the 14th century. It was not much, but it was some. And uh, we don't really know, but a castle was built here at that period, a small castle of wood. We don't know exactly if it was a Danish or a Swedish castle. It became eventually a Swedish castle, but I think it was originally a Danish castle because Danish power was much more important down here at that moment. So that was, after the landslide, the first major attempt to use the southern arm. And uh, from that moment on, the southern arm slowly regained its importance and became the most important arm. So that is a sort of background to the situation. Uh, there was another town further up the river here, uh, which was called Lödöse. Uh, that town uh, also existed in the 12th century. Uh, it is very little clear which state dominated it. Uh, there was a sort of Swedish influence, but also Danish influence and a Norwegian influence. And there is even, in some written sources, a mention of a meeting between the kings from the three different kingdoms in that town. So evidently that town attracted the political power rather than being the result of political power. But that town could not decide what happened further down the river. And that eventually became a problem for that town. So, uh, in the end of the 15th century, in, in the 16th century, Sweden emerges as a major power in Scandinavia. This is a big change. Sweden had been a minor player previously. And this new entity searched for a new connection to the Atlantic. Then this southern arm of the Jöta River becomes very important. And they try to uh, make a sort of major improvement on the castle constructed close to the estuary, the Elfsborg Castle. And they also construct a new town a little bit further up the river called New Lödöse. The old town further up was Lödöse. There was New Lödöse, Nya Lödöse in Swedish. Uh, this is the geographical situation in the beginning of the 16th century when Sweden starts to emerge as an important power. You have Sweden up here. And this area we are talking about is here. It's some maps from the period. And it's another one. And in this map, we can see that Sweden starts to claim an area. This red area is Denmark. This green is Norway. The yellow is Sweden. So in the beginning of the 16th century, Sweden has succeeded to claim an opening here in this area. Of course, this map was produced by people who is in, in sympathy with Sweden, so they have exaggerated the area uh, ruled by the Swedish king. But it was a fact that there was a Swedish dominance. They had a castle there, and they constructed a town here. We have not known much about that place. Uh, there are some limited written sources, mainly from the 16th century, 
some reports from the court of the town. Rather anecdotal, but interesting. Some royal decrees. The king in Stockholm, the capital of Sweden, is annoyed with the population of this town. They do as they like. They do not follow orders. And the king is very annoyed. Uh, but we had very little knowledge. Um, the town was situated in what is today part of Gothenburg here. Uh, and uh, there were some excavations in 1918. Uh, but with very poor technology in the fieldwork. So they failed to discover houses, streets and other things. But still, it was a sort of advancement of knowledge. They found a lot of ceramic materials and other things that demonstrated that it had been an important town in the 16th century. It was one of the large towns in Sweden at that time, but Sweden was a very poor and small country. Stockholm in 1500 had possibly 4,000 inhabitants. No other town in Sweden had a similar amount of inhabitants. If you compare to Paris, which had at that time in 1500 something like 50,000 inhabitants, it is nothing, 4,000. And this place may have it at its peak have had up to 1,500 inhabitants or 2,000. But it was still one of the largest in Sweden and in general in, in Scandinavia after Stockholm and Copenhagen. Uh, now, in 2010, the municipality and the county of Gothenburg in Western Sweden decided to do a major infrastructural transformation of this part of Gothenburg. According to Swedish law, if there is an interest in cultural heritage below ground in an area which you are going to exploit, you have to finance its study. So uh, there emerged a, a gigantic rescue archaeology operation. Uh, I do not know exactly the, the, the amount of money, but it was at that time one of the largest rescue archaeology operations in Sweden ever. We are speaking about um, uh, millions of euros, euros, uh, uh, plus gigantic. Uh, and it excavated um, approximately what we think is 30% of the old town, which was previously uh, almost unknown. Uh, I, I failed to advance here, yeah. There. Uh, this is the area excavated during the first two field seasons. Um, there was a, a project for a highway in the 1960s, which largely failed. Uh, so uh, this old failed uh, highway was removed. There were factories which were demolished, some residential units which were demolished. Uh, a railway system was moved. And below all this, below the asphalt, below the concrete buildings, we found the remains of the town relatively well preserved at many places with certain intrusions, but somebody had constructed a well or something else. Uh, it had been a wooden town. Basically, all buildings were of wood. Small cottages. There were a lot of animals in the town. Actually, for us today, it would have looked like a peasant village, I think, physically. There was only, as far as we know, up till now, only one building of stone, and that was the church. Nothing of this was visible above surface, not even the church. There had been some visible parts up to 1920. Uh, 
Nobody even knew where the church had been located. We found it. It was not at the place the municipality thought it would have been. Uh, there was a churchyard. The municipality thought that we would find perhaps a maximum of 50 persons buried at that place. We actually found several thousand. So they subestimated very much what this town had been. There are no maps of the town from the period it existed. This is a map from some years after it, its abandonment in 1624. And um, it shows how the city was located close to the Yota River and a smaller river which ends up in the Yota River. Um, it had some uh, a small ditch which was just one meter deep and a, a, a very low wall of uh, dirt, of earth, which would not hinder even cows from going in from the outside. There's a lot of discussion of that in these court protocols I mentioned earlier. Uh, so they were not actually effective defensive walls. Um, this uh, place became important in trade. Uh, this is a period beginning of the 16th century in, in which the Hansa organization, unification of certain uh, German towns in terms of trade, was still powerful. And this place had a lot of uh, contact with the Hansa. But what was more important, they started to break the dominance and the monopoly of the Hansa. So they started by themselves to communicate directly with Dutch uh, merchants, breaking the monopoly of the Hansa. And uh, towards the end of the existence of, of this town, uh, it uh, you could say that the Hansa depended on them more than the, they depended on the Hansa. Um, so this was actually a sort of very much both a, a sort of investment in, in making other type of trade conditions, but also a, a, a destructive, destru destroying the power of the Hansa, a political uh, operation. Uh, but the town was I think if we should try to describe it, something like a, a Klondike, a vile place, lots of violence, not very regularly ordered, uh, very much a lot of strange things occurred. Uh, when we looked at, um, at uh, people buried there, more than half of the men buried at the cemetery. And we are speaking about thousands, thousand at least persons, had wounds from uh, combat or fighting with arms, cuttings from swords particularly. So there was a, a, a constant presence of, of violence at, at this place. Uh, and it was dirty. It had no fortification. The Danish succeeded to conquer it several times and burnt it down. And the population had to run away and they tried to create a new town below the castle, close to the uh, two different efforts to do new towns close to the estuary, close to the castle, but, but they failed. Eventually the people returned to this place after the Danish had gone, the Danes had gone. This is um, the area excavated during the first field seasons, and you see a little bit of, of the field work going on here in this type of, of archaeological operation. These are areas excavated, the first two field seasons. Here is where the, it turned out that the church and the churchyard had been situated. There was actually a stone placed here stating that here was the church. Completely <laughs> wrong. <laughs> and nothing to do with it. It was not there. It was there. 
here are some uh, photographs from a, a, a part of, of this area before it became a part of Gothenburg towards the end of the uh, 19th century, before it became a, an important industrial part of Gothenburg. Here, uh, for example, the factory of SKF um, was founded and it's still the headquarters of that uh, company. Yeah. Uh, here um, is the, um, an effort of trying to reconstruct the, the, the church, which was relatively large, but not well constructed. It is well dated with wood because it had some wooden parts which we have been able to, to date with, with dendrochronology. Interestingly enough, the, the wood comes from the same area uh, in all different phases of the construction of the church and reconstruction. Uh, so they used wood from a particular area close by. Uh, the archaeological fieldwork uh, operated over a whole year. This is how it looked like. Uh, of course, there were other periods present. We found an inn on the churchyard, for example. This is the archaeological information in GIS format, the graphical information systems. Uh, it's based on, on uh, a lot of, of them. Uh, measurements and and it's all in in a sort of uh, geographical uh, coordinate system uh, and we found some indications of a, a very in simple uh, planning system with uh, uh, entities of, of 30 times 30 meters uh, placed along the streets they used at times stones to create pavements This is a very simple and basic reconstruction we did. Gothenburg was founded in 1621 as a free port. It was a royal decree and it decided that the population from other countries should be invited to come and they should be exempted from certain types of taxes in that trade. So a large part of the population became Dutch people, some people from Scotland and so on. The working people were Swedes, but the upper class was generally from other countries. It was also a military installation. This is a map from 1675. You can see that it was a, a very well planned town. It used uh, continental uh, models and ideals. It had a major fortification which existed all up to the 1850s, and it was removed. Uh, these fortifications never really came to be tested. There was an attempt to take the castle in uh, the 17th century, but um, they never really treated, uh, were a threat to, to the town. So um, while the other city would have needed fortifications, this did not actually need these massive fortifications it, it had. Uh, the center of Gothenburg still basically keep these streets as you see them here, but the buildings are completely different. Here, wooden buildings dominated in the early period, though there were some uh, buildings of brick and some buildings of stone. But the, the street the distribution of the streets is very similar to the distribution of the streets in, in uh, contemporary Gothenburg. There were a lot of canals. The town was largely planned by Dutch engineers, so they used Amsterdam and colon, uh, the colonies of, of Netherlands like uh, Pernambuco, Recife in Brazil or Batavia, Jakarta in, in Indonesia today as um, models for Gothenburg. Um, this is the central uh, 
square in Gothenburg. Today, it was also the central square in 1621. Uh, this plot was destined to German Lutheran church, and it is still the German Lutheran church in Gothenburg. It's a continuity in the use of that plot, though the building is not the same. Here, the work on the fortification has continued. This was one of the major engineers of the Swedish king, Erik Dahlberg, who made this work. There were also a lot of other fortifications along the, the river at different locations. And we also had this type of smaller fortifications all up to the Second World War. There were several small bastions constructed in the 1940s along the river at different positions. Here we see uh, the town in 1811. The fortifications are still in existence, uh, but the plan is very similar, as you can see. All from the beginning, uh, areas outside the walls were important. Uh, there were places for building ships, uh, factory units, uh, etc. And a lot of people lived outside the walls. Um, the walls were important in terms of taxation, but in terms of major activities, the walls are not important. So the people living outside were incorporated in the economy of the town. This is an example of a small fortification, which was still seen in 1811. It's actually located at uh, one, I mean, less than one kilometer from my house, this place. This is one of the fortifications in, uh, in central, uh, what is today center, central Gothenburg. And there were some towers to defend the town, which are still in place, actually. This is uh, the Elfbridge Castle, which I talked about earlier. They made a bigger castle in Desuary to replace the old one, which had become obsolete. Now it stopped for some. This is the new uh, fortification at an island in the estuary. It was founded by the Danes again, actually, when they wanted to conquer Gothenburg. <laughs> they founded a small castle at uh, one of the islands in the estuary. And then shortly after, when the Danes would, had been forced to, to run away, the Swedes constructed a big castle at the same island. So the building project was actually initiated by the Danes again. The second time, the second Elfberg castle was also founded actually by the Danes. This is still in place. This is Gothenburg in the late uh, 18th century. Uh, the port is largely inside the town, as you can see, small ships coming in with goods. They transport from the bigger ships outside. Uh, for the buildings you saw here, yeah, in this period, uh, in the late 18th century, most buildings are actually of wood, but uh, this is the city center, and in this area, bricks and stone dominate. Uh, but, but if you look at how the buildings were in general, in statistical terms, they were of wood. Most people lived in wooden buildings. That changed only uh, towards the end, I know, in, I would say in like 1900, that changed. This is the German Lutheran church you see there, which was the new German church, which was constructed at the same plot. Yeah, in, in the late 18th century. And you see one of these canals. And now we'll see if we can advance again. Um, in the 19th century, Gothenburg becomes the second most populated town in Sweden and becomes an industrial town. Uh, working class lives in wooden buildings and a lot of the wealthy people 
start building stone houses or brick houses for themselves. And uh, the stone becomes uh, an important element in the architectural profile of the town. We also see better sanitary solutions, water management, etc., emerging uh, from 1850, more or less. This is the stone town of Gothenburg, as it looked in 1920. These are buildings from 1880, 1890, for uh, middle class and upper class people in Gothenburg. As you see, they were very much interested in having trees to have a green environment. Most of these trees are not in existence today. Uh, in the 1940s, Sweden had become a major industrial area in Sweden. We had already at this time the SKF, uh, the big car factory of Volvo, and a lot of other important factories with a lot of people employed. We are speaking of tens of thousands uh, workers at, at an individual industrial plant. Uh, in the 1940s, uh, we see new residential units for workers built of concrete. This is an area called Guldheden, which was a sort of special project, but good buildings were built for the working class. This was a, a period in which the Social Democratic Party had a gigantic dominance in the votes. In 1944, they had more than 50% of the votes. And then the Communist Party had 10%, so they had like more than 60% of, of the Swedish population at the time. And that is a major factor behind the construction of this project, the Good Hidden project. Today, wealthy people want to live here because it's so cozy and so well constructed. There were also big investments in uh, creating uh, parks, um, and uh, in uh, art placed around the buildings. As you can see, they were inspired by Le Corbusier in the sense that there are individual buildings spread in the landscape, a green landscape. There, there it come. So, port, yeah, all from uh, 1621 was a major port. Today, it's the largest in Scandinavia. It's a very small compared to Hamburg or Rotterdam, but it is a large port. A gigantic amount of tons of goods passes through Gothenburg each year. This is the new town. I have this view from my house. It's very distant, but I can, if I have a good zoom, I can see this. Um, these are gigantic cranes from China. This is where the port is today. It's very close to the castle, the sports castle I showed, this island in the estuary, and they are destroying parts of the uh, arrangements of the castle at other islands close by which are simply destroyed for the expansion of the new port. Uh, it's an industrial town. This is the part, part of the factory plant of Volvo. Only a small part you see on this photography. The truck production is very important. Uh, there are many new buildings in the Volvo area, but also old buildings of poor quality. We know little about it. It's not well documented in uh, ways available to the public. Uh, we see it when something happens, when an old building starts to disappear in flames or something. Uh, some journalist succeeds to get a photography and we can see that it is not so that everything is modern and new. A lot of things here are old and from the 1950s and things and not in good condition. Where, where is the 
It is uh, on the bit that it, it, this island, which uh, is created by the two arms, northern and the southern. It, it's on that island. Yeah. It occupies um, a fourth of that island, the Volvo industrial plant area. Um, yeah. Uh, I think it, this title of my presentation actually was a sort of collaboration between me and Massimo, but I liked how it turned out. And it is a little provocative. I do not say a word about anything post-industrial or some um, sort of, of spectacle economy or, uh, or, or something like that. This is hardcore factory production that dominates the economy. And then we have a gigantic hospital and a gigantic university. And that is what dominates the economy of Gothenburg. It's nothing else. It's not a spectacle economy at all. It's not post-industrial. Uh, it's nothing of that. This is just traditional industrial society and a big port. So it is a provocation to state that, but it is what the facts say. Uh, these are uh, buildings from the uh, 20th century. Uh, here you have buildings uh, of stone in the lower part and wood in the upper parts, but it's hidden by this panel. That was a special permit from uh, the Swedish king. Uh, gave the city the right to build three-story buildings of wood but the lower part must be of stone. And that was the typical type of working class residential unit, multifamily unit from the 1860s onwards up to 1930, more or less. And this particular building was situated in the area we excavated in the new Lodos project. Uh, and uh, the were constructed by Albert Lilienberg, who was the state, uh, the, the city architect during a period from 1910 to 1930, more or less. He also constructed this type of stone buildings with a lot of decorations, which he said was inspired by uh, things from the, the Swedish medieval period, actually largely from Iron Age decorations on ceramics and uh, iron objects. He called it medieval architecture. I do not see anything medieval in it. Um, he later became the, the, the city architect of Stockholm, where he suggested the demolition of parts of the old town. It's very contradictory. <laughs> it was an, a medieval part he wanted to destroy. Today, what is happening is that uh, most of the old buildings remaining from the 19th century are uh, destroyed. Recently, they destroyed a building from 1820, which was in relatively good conditions, a wooden building, um, to build new buildings uh, like these. These are the architectural uh, uh, suggestions in their uh, public uh, propaganda, but these buildings are in existence today. I saw them before I left. <laughs> they are just finished, both of them. And I, 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 I visit this. Uh, I, I pass this area uh, each day when I go to my office when it's not a COVID period. Um, and um, they completely break the traditions of architectural space in Gothenburg. Uh, but the most strange thing is that the Construction companies themselves state that these buildings are supposed to last for 30 years. And they destroy buildings that have been in place for more than 100 years to construct a building which will last only 30 years. 30 years, yeah. And they say, and the strangest thing is that they speak about sustainability, but it's not sustainable in terms of the quality of the building. Uh, and, uh, of course, demolishing a building is very destructive for the environment. These are concrete buildings, basically, so they will be very destructive when they are demolished. Are they planning a system of transport, aerial transport? 
there that is a sort of project that is not in existence. It's only the buildings. Do you think that they will build the, the system or the system? The, the, this is an idea to cross the river on, on such a, 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 a model, yeah. But I don't know if it will happen. I'm not certain. But they did construct a new bridge. They replaced that bridge I, I showed previously. And the new bridge is rather horrendous, uh, actually. But this is this is this is architecture today in Gothenburg. The most recent things, um, and uh, built for for a duration of of thirty years. But the building has been built in this in this way. This building has been built this way. Looks like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is horrendous. But, uh, it's my personal opinion, but uh, and I saw the construction process. It's basically concrete, so we are not speaking about some sort of sustainable meter materials and right? of course, but some de details. I guess uh, the covering of the building uh, is, is sustainable or something. But, uh, the basic construction is just a traditional concrete building. Uh, so we are not speaking about sustainability in any sort of way, actually, when it comes to it. Yeah, and this building is is like something of what the group used in 1950 in the United States. It is not it is not even a new thing. It's very ugly and traditional in a way. The worst part of, of modernist architecture. Yeah, uh, actually. That building does not exist anymore. They will construct another building here. That was a building from 1820, 1810, of wood, which I have recently destroyed. And there are lots of protests, but few tell. Okay. I was asking exactly. Yeah. Just this is right. the people that are there were lots of protests, even from, even from, uh, uh, actually, and that was an interesting thing from the Department of Architecture at the Technical University. Even a lot of people there protested when they decided to demolish that building. Uh, and that is interesting because in Sweden, the, the formation of an architect today uh, has very little of, of history in it, of knowledge of history. Uh, that was removed in the 1980s. Uh, and a new sort of, of discipline was constructed, which was named uh, building antiquarian uh, and uh, that was placed at, at other universities outside the technical universities uh, so uh, in the formation of the architect from the 1980s up till a couple of years ago uh, there was almost nothing about history in no sort of way so that was an interesting thing that they had started to go back to 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 think about uh, historical uh, buildings and about history uh, clearly indicated uh, in their protest uh, in relation to the demolition of that building. I actually have some photographs from the demolition process, which, but I, I couldn't uh, integrate whatever quantity of, of images in my presentation. Uh, so of course, I could go on eternally, uh, but uh, we must go on in the program. Uh, and I think we have some time limit also today. Uh, but um, thank you for listening. And uh, later on, we can have, if, if you have questions, I, I would be glad to, uh, if, if you could have a discussion on, on uh, this town and, and different issues that could come up in relation to the discussion on this town. Thank you. L'ultima cosa che ci ha detto, avete sentito, no? che nelle facoltà di architettura dagli anni Ottanta non si insegna più la storia dell'architettura. E mi verrebbe da dire si vedono i risultati, no? <ride> Una cosa un po' curiosa, eh, anzi, se ho capito bene, ieri sera mi dicevi che soltanto c'è una scuola a parte in mm. cui c'è una formazione storica yeah. e quindi 
c'è una sorta di specializzazione che ti consente poi di lavorare su, su, ad esempio, su edifici storici da conservare, ma gli architetti che escono dalle scuole di architettura non studiano più la storia dell'architettura. Completely separated things. Completely separated. They don't sort of conflict of any kind between them. Mm. And they are not at all thinking, these building and the parents are not thinking about how to build a new building or how to transform landscapes. So we are discussing a little bit about how to conserve the building. Allora, um, prima di avviare la discussione, inviterei i nostri discussant. Volete farla da lì? Cioè, volete condividere voi la presentazione senza... Ok, facciamo così che è meglio. <coughs> Stiamo aspettando un giorno perché ne avevamo una stagione stampare una volta per altri giorni di giugno. Ah, non è niente. Però magari ne abbiamo fatto qualche dopo, solo che abbiamo un'idea di stampa. Che è come se fate il video adesso. Non lasciamo stare la stampa, dai. Lasciare controllare il controllo. E poi gliela diamo in digitale. Uh, Ah, sì, relatore. Allora, Marco Tresca. Eh? Sì, sì. Cambia. Dove faccio? Oh, finalmente. Non lo sapevo. Ma se si potesse anche mettere in tutto schermo, questo non l'ho capito cosa si può fare. Ah, questo è il massimo. Allora, adesso um, come vi avevo preannunciato c'è la, la um, piccola ricerca che hanno fatto eh, i, nostri, i vostri colleghi, eh, Marco Tresca, Giulia Valentini e Emanuela Allegri, Grilli, Grilli. dovrei ricordarmelo, cioè, siamo quasi omonimi. Ehm, quindi questa diciamo che è la, la, la parte di lavoro che spetta a voi quando eh, ciascun gruppo sarà eh, chiamato a svolgere questo ruolo di discussant dell'ospite del ciclo di lezioni Cities of the World. Eh, tutte queste ricerche poi confluiranno in questa sorta di atlante di mappe sulle città del mondo che stiamo costruendo eh, progressivamente insieme. È un lavoro collettivo che poi magari cercheremo anche un giorno, chissà, di pubblicare con una piccola pubblicazione. Allora, a voi la parola e grazie. So, 
Ethereum BTC, and they will somehow uh, reverse traffic from uh, uh, the formation in uh, uh, 1921 to nowadays. So, there is also our research as shown how much the power is changed from a year for city to any part of the industrial standard at the uh, time before. So, the main states of the CPU brand fabric are uh, from 17, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 1675 to 1881 when the city limits expanded beyond the world due to the increase of the population and the role of government as an infrastructure And from 1909 to present day, because the city became home of a large company like FKA and Google. Um, uh, presently, uh, Gothenburg is the second largest city in Sweden and it takes over 150 days to rain, almost 14%. Uh, uh, and moreover, it's. Uh, <laughs> moreover, it's uh, developed on the near slope that particularly in the city center are lower than the sea level. Uh, so the either rain and the climate change may be planned similarly at the risk of flooding. And for the reason, uh, blue green is infrastructure uh, wet uh, So an example is the planning of uh, uh, Biscoff's garden. Uh, where the city is developing a uh, rain path that gather water and uh, creates area where it can be flat and different. Another example project uh, is the requalification of uh, uh, Max uh, Max Gagen. I'm sorry for the pronunciation of this word. Uh, in collaboration with the Swedish University of uh, Agricultural Science. So it first and identified 300 trees of appropriate spaces that can withstand wind and rain. So uh, this green infrastructure go far beyond the aesthetic benefits because they create a better microclimate, a reduced flow rate, a better air quality, a greater biodiversity, and a better living environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you can see a map uh, uh, at right in the uh, first project. Okay, this is the first project in the uh, uh, Biscoff Garden, and this is the second one at the uh, Moscow um, Garden. I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Uh, yeah, it's the same as K in French. K is it's where the small harbor was hit with the long. Yeah. It's the same in French, and then say K. And the K is Swedish. Swedish. No, I shouldn't say that word. And it's only to switch that language. So it's exactly the same as K in French. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It's cat tie, it's your cat in French. There is no man, 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 no Given by the wind in the states, the high, yes. the high, high uh, uh, mass, the uh, 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 mass, and boot, that is how you put the boot to construct such a mass. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the south side of walls of the ancient town. It was the location of production of mass for the same vessels. 
So uh, first, uh, we took a study from a master's degree uh, of Lund University that showed uh, interesting graphics about uh, flood risk and uh, green spaces. So, uh, we took a small sample of uh, six examples of uh, these green areas. Uh, one of the biggest that we could find uh, is Stock Stockholm Park. Yeah, and it's the forest of the castle. Yes. But the forest oh, belonged the to the expert castle. It was not situated close to the castle, but it belonged to the castle. So it was mm -hmm. the royal hunting ground. Mm -hmm. The huge area was reserved for the king to hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, so it belonged to the king. It was not possible to use it for education in the town. Okay. Uh, but when the, the, the king decided to give it up, give it to the municipality, they decided that it should be a kind of park. On that area. So that is the largest green space within the size of Gothenburg. Mm -hmm. we, we found uh, lots of green uh, areas, both large and smaller. So the largest uh, is Kogan Park uh, and uh, others that follow the river, like, um, uh, for example, uh, um, Kings Park. Mm. Um, and uh, um, the horticultural garden, I must. Just yes, like yes. right, say a personal thing, a personal note. In the 1950s, they uh, had the idea of uh, demolishing that building. Really? Mm -hmm. From the 1970s. You want to demolish and to take And to take away that uh, garden. And I can say on a personal note, but my father played a bigger role in, in saving it. Oh, wow. Through some international publications on that. Ha, diciamo, contribuito a evitare che quell'edificio venisse demolito a un certo punto vogliono tenere il quello. Ma cosa volevano fare? Cosa volevano fare quando volevano fare? Dopo la demolizione. Cosa volevano fare? Factory. Ah. In the middle of the park. Yeah. Wow. Ok. Again, another park. This one. The most part of the mall, uh, Heisen Park, uh, at, the, at the edge of the city. And uh, we also took uh, um, a study um, by Lang University that showed uh, the difference in percentages of uh, uh, green areas and uh, cemented areas, uh, mm -hmm. because it uh, was uh, one of the main causes of floods uh, that uh, plagued the city when the big rainstorm. So the permeable and non-permeable and non-permeable areas. Um, after that, uh, we found another study um, during a workshop of this university uh, that studies uh, the accessibility of slow traffic uh, in the cities. Uh, so for, for uh, the specific uh, bus codes and pedestrians uh, in uh, a future project of Gothenburg. 
so in this graph we have uh, three types uh, of, uh, of uh, waypoints. Uh, so accessibility creates uh, a new path uh, from north to south uh, to link uh, uh, to link uh, all parts of the city, like for creating uh, a kind of small Los Angeles, little Los Angeles as they call it, with uh, a grid system that could but uh, exclusive for pedestrian and bicycle. Then uh, we have uh, the livable aspect, uh, so the green aspect. Uh, the public park that follow the river, uh, attractive public space, uh, and um, that could be used uh, by every inhabitant of Gothenburg. And then, and then we have uh, we had a study about the density of the city. Um, so uh, it was um, a study that showed uh, that um, aimed to create uh, a multiple urban course core. Uh, so that every part of the city could appreciate uh, um, a different kind of public activity based on the density of that area. Okay, so going forward. That is, that, that, that building is quite common. It's from 1900. Yeah, it's yeah, it was a fish market. Yeah, it is the fish market. market, and it was constructed being the uh, fish and market. A fish market, yeah, and uh, it, it has a very particular architecture, uh, and it is 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 this there's a dialect in Gothenburg which is very particular, and they have written on the facade at the moment of its construction, the fish church, but yeah. in the local dialect. It's, it's very funny. Work. It's written as if that was a real language. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not Swedish. It's Gothenburgish. Oh. Uh, fish church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was a sort of intention from the, the architect that it should look like a church, yeah. but being a marketplace for fish. Yeah. Yeah. There is really a uh, something like that. It's similar to German. I think the conclusion we did a research about the main iconic architecture of the city. For example, uh, we have the fish church that is an historical place where you can buy fresh fish at the uh, then there is the Kagan and uh, office building linked to the university campus. Uh, it is the best example of a contemporary architecture in the city. Uh, another modern building is the Gothenburg Opera House, uh, that is uh, among the best opera houses uh, of the world. Very close to yeah. Yeah. It's almost on the river, uh, no. and it's supposed to look a little bit uh, as a boat, as you can see, but it's only from a very particular angle. Sorry, like it's yeah. supposed to look like a uh, ship. Like that, uh, uh, it's supposed to look like a ship. Yes, yes, yes. But it's only, from, it's, it's only from this particular angle. Yeah. Uh, by an angle in front of the river. Yeah. Are, are they from Swedish architects or? Yes, the architect was a man called Johnny Sikovitz. Yeah. I know him. Mm -hmm. By another <laughs> theatre is the Stora Theatre, designed by Karl Malberg. It's been renovated a number of times, but uh, the new rounds are long remain. That's a funny building. Yeah. So it's this is it's a, 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 this a, a, is a Swedish house from another time. So it's a brand new building? Which house? Uh, the the Stora Theatre. No, no, this is from. Uh, this is a home? At 1900 or something. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, 
that they preserve the, uh, they, they preserve the original organization. So it's a sort of historical environment of an opera. Mm -hmm. So that's the most interesting thing. It's like a historical document of, of an opera of that period. Mm -hmm. And it's used today for other things, but musical performances and things like that. Yeah. And this building is from the from 1980s. Mm. That is Ralph Erskine. In, in Gothenburg, they have a special type of... Uh, Ralph Erskine. Yeah. yeah, I know this thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, in Gothenburg, it has that type of uh, jokes. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that is called the lipstick. Now it's now it's the uh, discussion time. Yeah. I could, I could comment uh, just briefly some of the things you mentioned. Mm -hmm. so I showed a photograph with all these streets along the street mm -hmm. of 1920. With the trees? With the trees, yeah. So actually, uh, in 1900, the planning, the urban planning, involved green spaces much more than today. Mm -hmm. So they're trying in a way to go back to that. <clears throat> they removed all these trees after 1920. So it was a sort of positive. And, and it's actually interesting because as archaeologists we study also major transformations to time in, in the landscape, the natural landscape. And we see how from the 17th century the use of food was so intense and it continued through the 7th century, it's that in 1880 there were basically no trees along the western coast. Wow. So then they started in the 1880s the uh, uh, reforestation project. And today it's rather honest that only in 1880 there were almost no trees. That uh, was an advantage when the archaeologists started to to prospection and surveys because they could see much more than we can today and it's all forested. But it, it was a completely different landscape. So in the period from 1882 to 1920, there was a lot of preoccupation and interest in the question of making green space. And that was much more systematic in a larger scale and so on than these places today. And uh, the most uh, the most important element in the urban policy today is densification. This so is densification hmm. to put more buildings in the same space. So they, as you saw on these photographs, these were open areas previously, but these two buildings are erected today, and that is a typical strategy. So they are removing areas that could be that is the most important policy. So the other projects are subordinated to that general policy of taking away opportunities for green and open spaces, which is the major policy at the present, densifying the general architecture in the city centre. Uh, what the general population of Latin world thinks of this uh, policy? Uh, do they care or...? Uh... It's difficult to say. It's, um, it's difficult to say. But, um, the, the population of Latin world uh, it's multifaceted, of course. So, uh, I would say that these Dutch and, and Scottish uh, elite persons who dominated Gothenburg from the 17th century up to the end of the 19th century, they had a special work out uh, which marked Gothenburg. Uh, they wanted it to be a little bit an international one, but they were not so much interested in. Uh, having a character of capitalism. It's, it's very different from Stockholm. Yeah. Um, and and uh, you could also see it in politics that people acted differently in relation to certain 
nevertheless prone to accept traditional conventions in Swedish society, more open minded in certain ways. At the same time, they were very much interested in commerce and in industrial enterprise. So that dominated everything and was more important than any other factor. So, for example, if we um, could you move this a bit in this direction? Yeah, no, I have a direction. So, yeah, here. Yeah, there were large, uh, the Sweden was a, a major area for production of uh, boats in Scandinavia, <coughs> large vessels for uh, tra international transport. And there were large uh, wharves here, uh, and they were in operation until the 1980s. From 1621 up to the 1980s, the end of 1970s, we had gigantic areas of for, uh, production of big vessels tanks and things like gigantic boats. And that was a, a, an important part of, of the industrial life we talked about up to 1970s when they closed it down. That was a very stupid thing to do. Today, I think there is a lot of, of demand of yeah. quality ships. Yeah. But they closed all down. The, the, the alternative would have been to preserve one and being able to expand again. But when they were at, at their highest point, uh, they could do whatever they want. The owners of these uh, works, they were gigantic and they needed new terrain. And uh, here uh, in more or less in this area, they took away a small uh, mountain. A small mountain? They exploded. It, it, it was covered with small uh, <coughs> buildings for the upper middle class and the uh, upper class families with gardens and things. So a huge size. Her hill, large hill with a lot of buildings, and they just took it all away to flood, to, to, to make, make it flat area. And then <coughs> this new installation lasted only for 20 years. And they had taken away a hill. I said that it is very curious. Uh, and and now, now they have made a residential area there. But they're, and this is very curious now. They make new residential areas along the river here. New residential areas. New residential areas are here and along the river here. So it's absurd thinking about this climate change and all that. So, I mean, they have these small projects which you discussed, which try to counter these problems created by this climate change. But the major politics are going in the opposite direction. They, they, they won't bother at all. And, and they, they just intensify the use of the areas close to the river with buildings, not green areas. So what part is your opinion about the future planning of the city? I, I think we need to change the policies on planning um, and make another type of urban planning. And personally, I, I, I think that uh, the period in the 1940s was quite interesting. That was another thing, way of thinking. It was more about constructing something that could last a long period and constructing a nice environment for people in the long run. But um, we do not have that today. But how it works, the, I mean, the, the planting of the town is made by the municipality itself, or it is it's, it's a sort of collaboration between the county and the municipality. And also the Swedish government intervenes because they have gigantic uh, projects with much money. So some projects are realized because money exists. Mm. We should do something because there is money <laughs> to invest money. To invest money. And that, of course, I think the major cause for this project from the point of view of the government is to create working opportunities. To work and uh, work, work opportunities. Yeah. Because uh, in Sweden, I, I think that is also the case in certain other countries, uh, from 1920 or something, uh, the most important uh, means of the central government to, uh, uh, to say, uh, influence the uh, labor market has been to invest in construction. 
So if, if there is a period with problems uh, and uh, as a decrease of working opportunities, mm -hmm. the low amount of available uh, employment opportunities, then the state uh, invent different major gigantic construction uh, yeah, and This is a typical strategy. In so in the, in the end of uh, the 1960s, I had a large such project for it's called a million uh, apartment project. And they constructed low quality concrete buildings. Some of them have already been demolished because they were so low quality. Yeah. In a very short period, they constructed gigantic amount of buildings. And general outside uh, the city force. Uh, but that creates a gigantic amount of temporary work for construction workers. So we had uh, during yes. a period uh, 400,000 people or so working as industrial workers of construction. In construction sector. Yeah, in the construction sector. <coughs> and, and then in, in the end of the 1980s, I believe it was down to 50,000. And now 50,000. It's a gigantic uh, change. And then now it's up again. Mm. So it goes up and down. Yeah, and, and I think another factor, of course, are the construction companies that they gain a lot of money from these projects. But that's another factor that influences uh, development as well. Very interesting in mind. So uh, the financial interest and uh, the interest in, in creating working opportunities. I think those factors are more important than the rhetorical argument presented for a construction project. The rhetorical, the rhetorics are different, saying something that now we must have a, a landmark in Gothenburg, a new building in Denmark, mm -hmm. uh, or something that is important because that will attract the international uh, trading to Gothenburg, but that is not the major reason. Mm -hmm. Something else. And uh, does uh, a landmark uh, exist right now in Gothenburg? A, pop, a popular landmark, a uh, uh, modern landmark, uh, something, something that people relate to? No. No? It's just traditional things. <coughs> there are some traditional buildings from the beginning of the 20th century. Um, actually, uh, the only things. There is a church on this small hill called Mastrogut. Uh, that is a classic thing. You see it if you come in through the river, you see it very clearly. That has been portrayed much in movies from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. So that, that church is, is a, a sort of landmark. Um, and some other things. But uh, I do not, uh, you can see this This is here. This area is that ch church. Uh, that is a, a, a brick church. Constructed in 1900 in a sort of uh, romantic uh, uh, nationalist style. That is the church. Yeah. There, there, there are too many people in Gothenburg. That is an important landmark. If inside, uh, it, it is supposed to look like a Viking Age house. Mm -hmm. uh, and fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, and but it has, has a very nice view. If you come to Gothenburg to get a good view of the center of the town, you can go up there. Because it's in a higher in a high position. position. Yeah. And so uh, yeah. what about modern iconic buildings? Yeah. The, the lipstick? The lipstick and that. I don't think it is. They have densified. So uh, it is almost impossible to move around in that area, around the lipstick. Enormous amount of new buildings there. Um, so that is, uh, but I, I think they are thinking about doing a new building on the island, uh, which would be like a screw and very high. <coughs> but um, they were to construct it on clay soil. And of course, even the most um, Pro commerce engineer had to admit, admit that it was complicated to construct a gigantic high skyscraper of complex construction on clay. On clay. On movable clay. <laughs> yeah, it's a risk. It, 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 it's a risky thing. 
And then they had to pass me something, and there is a mountain two kilometers away, so they have some idea of connecting it to cables of iron <laughs> to no, that mountain. You're joking. And you can't take a lot of money and not very secure anyhow. So it's just a stupidity. Also, we found a strange construction called Sauna. Uh, on the north side of the river. Sauna? It's the last part. Lo cerco. So here, here you can see the, the old city center, just as I showed. Yeah. The same street. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that is a strange building. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 This is the one. In, in general, for people in government, it's not important. Uh, it is an industrial construction. Yeah, uh, recycle. Mm. Recycle material. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's strange. But, yeah. but actually, it's a, it's a sauna. It's a sauna. For people in government, it's not an important construction. It's beautiful, this interior. I like it, the interior. The interior is nice. Yeah. It is mm. a Finnish sound. The type is a Finnish sound. But it's very bizarre. It's bizarre, yeah. But, uh, it's let's do it weird. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is... Uh, 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 Ah, uh, it's by recycled yeah. metallic panels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, wow. Yeah, it's <laughs> cold. To go down into the water when it's very chilly in the winter and go into the south. Mm. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, but maybe the water is not the same water from the the arbor. It is, yes. It is. But it is it's supposed to be clean. Yeah. When I was a kid, you couldn't uh, bath in the river, but today they say it's possible. Yeah? yeah. With the with the boats? Yeah, they say it's possible. It's not polluted. Yeah, they say it is possible. To they bath. say. The same person that wants to build on the, on the clay. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, it's... Um, um, I, I, I think people think that this is a funny thing, but it's it's not landmark. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, have other questions, ragazzi? What is about the foundation, the clay foundation of the city? Has ever caused uh, any recent trouble? Uh, for example, um, uh, structural uh, criticality in the Any crit crit criticality in the yes. buildings? For it does, it does. There oh, are, they are, uh, um, many buildings have uh, uh, small scars, you could say, mm. from moving clay. So, mm. so they, they have them. scars in the... Uh, yeah, and they're abandoned, they left... Uh, uh, in certain cases, in other cases, they try to repair them. Um, and uh, uh, for example, in this area where we were excavating the old uh, town up there, uh, <coughs> up there, the go kart central. <laughs> go kart. Yeah, yeah here. Uh, here, we were excavating there. Mm -hmm. This is the small river. <coughs> Yeah, and uh, uh, when we were working there, they were doing these gigantic infrastructure transformations, and the building company was Skanska, it's a big operating space in construction. They started to move clay <coughs> for the construction work from one part to another in that area, and uh, suddenly they had not. I mean, I don't know. They, they should have consulted geologists more than they did. 
But suddenly some geologists discovered that this plane they had moved started to move by itself. Mm. Uh, so there was a very high risk for a gigantic landslide. So they had to stop all the construction work for seven months and create a wall to, mm -hmm. stop, the to stop the clay. Go down with concrete posts down and, and, and then construct a wall around that and put up iron bars mm. only to stop the clay from moving more. And it was a process initiated by consultants. Mm -hmm. It cost a gigantic amount of money. I think it would have been better to consult the really <laughs> well and good with the audience first before you do that sort of crazy thing. And despite that, I mean, I could repeat that kind of stories again and again from several experiences. They just won. Like this idiotic idea of the big tower on the clay saw on the island. They should know that this is not a good idea. I hope, I hope that nothing uh, dangerous happens. Uh, I, I also hope that. This is a cemetery? Yeah. It is a cemetery. Oh. Is the Eastern Cemetery, which has that sort of strange planning. Uh -huh. And here you have right. some very, in general, the difference between different burial of so marked, but here you have some elite burials uh, of remarkable uh, size and character, which differ a lot from the normal ones. And this uh, uh, is the, the so called Jewish cemetery. It's, Jewish cemetery. Yeah, and that is mainly uh, people who arrived uh, to Sweden. Uh, in poor condition from Nazi concentration camps. Mm. And uh, they died. A large percentage of them died in Gothenburg and they had to be burned somewhere. Mm. So the the economy in in Gothenburg is run by Volvo, by SKF yeah. and by real estate yeah. operations and the port of course and the port sorry and the port so um, and, and as an example the there is the, the the port has been divided into parts it, it was one company owned by the municipality previously now it's divided so the municipality has half and private interests have other parts and one of these private parts had a very dramatic relationship to the workers there was a major strike which lasted for almost two years and it was an impossible situation uh, and it was very difficult for Gothenburg as a whole to have that situation. The other parts operate, but not that part, and uh, they didn't know how to solve it. And they tried to integrate the government to stop all uh, and other things. But in the end, it was the, the the general director of Volvo. The general director of Volvo intervened personally and uh, ordered that company to make a good agreement with the workers. So, Vol so Mr. Volvo has Mr. gigantic uh, Mr. Volvo, power. Yeah. Mr. Volvo is something, is someone very important. Yeah. In, in the even a retired Volvo, Volvo director has a yeah. big influence. Over the but time. my question is. Uh, how the global forces, the global investors, are acting in the Gothenburg market? I mean, the new buildings, the new towers, yeah. are they from Swedish investors or from Asian or Emirates? That, or something that else? Are, uh, about all Chinese interests. Chinese. Okay. But uh, the Chinese are about over formally. Even if there are Swedish uh, people uh, operating it. Um, but uh, large Swedish companies uh, produce, they, they, they produce products in, in Bangladesh and other countries. The clothing companies, the sell clothes, uh, they have gigantic factories in Bangladesh, and all their clothes comes to Gothenburg. So uh, it's a key point in that trade. Mm -hmm. And that is driven from Gothenburg. 
Mm. It's a direct operation. They have uh, factories in Bangladesh and the products come to Papua. Mm. So in that case, the, the, the thing is, is uh, the decisions are made in Gothenburg. Mm. So the headquarters are in Gothenburg? Yeah, for those, in those cases, but mm -hmm. not necessarily so in other branches. But Gothenburg has a fairly large and strong position for, for its size and, and so for its size. It has its own system. But are you uh, working on the um, evolution of this economy? I mean, industry 4.0, mm -hmm. uh, industry of uh, culture, industry of creativity, because you say that you are in a, a traditional economy mm. with the port, with the mm. factories, with the real estate, mm. they are actually old fashioned mm. uh, exactly. economy. It is, it is that. Is there, is there any uh, process of uh, evolving the economy in a new era? To a certain extent, perhaps, in, in the sense that um, there are demands on the industrial sector to uh, create less polluting factories and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But what I would say is that, that uh, the central government of Sweden during the last 30 years or so has not been interested in discussing the industrial sector. Mm -hmm. They have left it. Uh, as at its own mercy, but it is so strong that it has survived. But now the tendency in the parliament, and this is something that has occurred during the last 18 months, suddenly a lot of parties from all types have reinitiated discussion on the industrial sector. So it's more trying to go back to that, but in a new way. Mm. To go back to that model of industrial society, but uh, with ecological and other parameters involved. Mm. Uh, that is what is dominating now, and I'm, I'm surprised. It has come very fast. I, I, I have criticized the lack of interest in the industrial sector. But now, three or four of, of the largest parties began to address this question explicitly. Mm -hmm. And uh, the left, so called left party, the Social Democratic Party, the largest conservative party, the moderates, uh, all discuss this uh, quite a lot now. Mm -hmm. uh, and the need for intervention from the state. Mm -hmm. You need to be prepared for the next. Yeah, uh, era when, when maybe when maybe it won't go. I hope this will never fail. Mm -hmm. But you know the big cars company are always in a yeah. critical situation. Yeah, and, so, and I think that is in in we could say that in 1970 the industrial economy of Gothenburg was much more diversified than today. Was diversified. There were many different branches. Yeah, this is important. And today we have very few branches. Yeah. So we are more dependent on oil than ever. Mm. And that has been a sort of, of lack of interest from the government, both the, the municipality company and in Stockholm, to try to help the creation of new types of branches when it comes to uh, factories and industry. Mm. And I think it is very important to have a wide base so there can be areas that can grow when necessary. Yeah. And that is something that has not been addressed much. And that is something we have been discussing all since the end of the 70s, actually. But the municipality in the country has not been addressed in the US yet. Allora, chi ha the domanda del mare? Anche in italiano. Yes, please. I, I understand. Quite lots of work. Thank you. Thank you.
la storia del mio ah, non ce l'abbiamo più. Poi, ehm, fatto un'esplosione industriale, combinazione, fatto di nuovi edifici, diciamo, la scomparsa e il fatto che la storia per città è un po' ignorata mentre il resto andava avanti e si espandeva. Il dato è similare a questo. Similare a questo. Yeah. We, we, we had a fortress around the scala. I will show you the maps. It was quite um, important fortress, but then it was destroyed for the, 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 the growth of the city. Yeah. So in the, in the 1850s, more or less, they took away this, this uh, fortification. Yes, it's a small piece preserved at some point here, more or less. Yeah. 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 But, uh, yeah. but uh, this, uh, this panel uh, was left intact. Uh, yeah. And that is uh, uh, Rema. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, here. Yeah. If you go back here, yeah, there. These new buildings I demonstrated, they are here. So they have completely uh, changed the character of this area. Yeah. So that is, uh, today it's so, <laughs> that image. But this is one of the major panels. But it looks very pleasant. Yeah, this area, if you forget about these two buildings there, it's very nice actually. <coughs> in particular in the summer, it's very nice here. Yeah. Uh, and here are some uh, fine, uh, some restaurants and, and things here. Yeah. You can play bull and eating. Bull? Bull, yeah. And uh, what was there before the donation? So before the being a spot? In this area, yeah. it was, uh, yeah, you have been trying to, to understand that uh, through a lot of uh, trenching, excavating in, in the area. Uh, it is a, a, a sort of a bushy area uh, with a certain humidity, but it's not, a, it's not a, really a, a marshland, but it's not, it has a high humidity. But it's not a marshland. So it was used as a place to land, maybe this big, for, for uh, uh, sheep and cattle uh, before uh, the construction of it on the little top. It was not intensively used, it was extensively used as a place to land. And, and where it, when it was not uh, eaten up by the animals, it was just a small, small bushes dominating. And in the area. So that, that is actually, we, 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 we didn't know until or two years ago when we had done it. So a lot of people speculated. Some thought that it was a marshland, but it was not a marshland. Um, but it was it had a high humidity. It was not a very hospitable environment. Allora, altre domande? No. Sì, altri? Sì, io volevo chiedere eh, qual è l'approccio che eh, utilizzano eh, i servizi eh, urbanistici quando vanno a pensare a spazi pubblici e a spazi sportivi, perché vedo che comunque c'è uno stadio nuovo, uno stadio vecchio, un'area molto importante per lo sport come un parco piccolo pubblico e in più il, quel parco che ci osteggia vero questa questa mia zona stadio nuovo stadio vecchio tutta la, 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 la parte sportiva e mi ricorda anche un po' un approccio, un approccio di Copenaghen che ha spazi pubblici molto naturali, semplici, puliti, senza, senza recinzioni, molto open space. Yeah, eh, here, here, here the, the main policy, as I said before, is densifying. That is taking away, taking away open spaces. That is the main policy. Uh, What about the sports field? Yeah, I should say first, this area was, I mean, the fortification was here, 
Yeah. And outside, on the other side, there was an area that was open so that uh, it was easy to, to uh, shoot down a possible intruders. It was an open area and had some external defenses. And when they took away the fortification, they left this as a sort of green belt in the 1850s, decided to, to transform it to green belt. Um, so that's the story of that green area. And it's much discussed today what to do with this. Uh, there are some problems. Uh, there is a lot of uh, people selling drugs here, for example. <laughs> so children, families with children will not use this area for uh, as a sort of um, attractive environment. Um, this is an arena from the 1960s, and that is one recently built. And, and the, again, the, the, the jokes in Gothenburg, there was another one here, which was from the 1920s. Huh? That was called the Ullevi. So and it's and when they constructed this one, they called it a new Udemy Arena. Uh, then they demolished the old one, and then there was a sort of there was a, 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 a competition for a new name of it, and they had a general vote. And you know what the new arena is called? The old arena. The old. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the location of the old arena. So the, the new arena, the newest arena is called the old arena. That's funny. And, and, and it, the, the one called the new arena is the old one. <laughs> That's typical Gothenburgish joke. Uh, what about the, <clears throat> the open fields? I mean, is there any law um, preserving these fields from building? Being there is a, a they have a, a very complex when I'm working with this landscape architect, I'm learning more about these things. Uh, there, there are different levels of protection. Uh, some are very hard, but they cover very few areas. Mm. Others are more a common practice mm. and they can be violated. Mm. Uh, and this area is not, as I as far as I've understood, it's not very well protected. Not so it could, it, it could be taken away, yes. Wow. This particular, uh, well, for example, Slotskogen is very much protected, the big uh, park. park. That, that is very, that's a high protective level. Mm -hmm. but that would be difficult to, to transform to a residential area. There are actually people who, who advocate to, to uh, make uh, transform this to, to buildings. There are threats. Yeah, there are suggestions, advanced suggestions about that. This is one of the discussions. Yeah, this this was uh, the era of uh, in the 1850s. The era of the, the, what is it called? The, the, the army, when they train soldiers, they do exercises. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is what's called the, the area for exercises. Mm -hmm. for, for, for the Yeah, for the Shoot. military. Yeah, not only that, to learn to march and okay. anything. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and in, in uh, you <clears throat> Dartmoor and, and, and all those, those areas in, in, in England and Scotland, uh, we have similar areas in Sweden, and they are called the Ed. They are relatively open areas with no vegetation. There are very little vegetation. So this was called Heden, the exercise area Heden uh, in Gothenburg. Then in the 1930s, they decided to construct a Catholic church, the first Catholic church in, in Gothenburg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they, they, in Gothenburg, of course, they had this tradition of yoking. Now, it was constructed on the side of the Heden, and <clears throat> uh, 
Eden in Swedish is the period with paganism. The heathens, the pagans. This is the name. The Eden, yeah. So that is the. So then the Gothenburgers called this Catholic church the Heathen Dome. Eden Dome and Pagan Dome. Dome? Like the, 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 the Dome. The Pagan Dome. Ah, wow. This is the Catholic Church is called the Pagan Dome. This is a and it is a, it's such a, a strong uh, tradition that I know I know some people who are members of this uh, church and they themselves call they call it, it the, the, the Pagan. Dome. Yeah, and they say Pagan Dome, Pagan Dome. This is the particular type of of joking that we show in Gothenburg. <laughs> Let me show you uh, some ancient maps of Pescara. If anyone wants to ask something, please. Se qualcuno vuole fare domande, siete sempre. Della città. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that is sort of interesting. Yeah. Uh, I hope I, 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 I'm working on a book with this translation, and I hope that we could uh, include a short discussion about that. Uh, uh, so we are working on that a little bit. Um, but, um, I should also mention, yes, as, as you understand, uh, this is an important year for Gothenburg, 400 years since its foundation. Um, but because of the COVID, they have decided to do the celebration in 1623. Mm -hmm. And it is fun because they celebrated 350 years uh, in uh, 1923. And that was because we had had the uh, First World War and uh, uh, this, this disease is called the Spanish fever in Sweden. Uh, Spanish and, fever. Yeah, they had uh, created a big problem in Gothenburg. A lot of people died. So they decided to postpone the celebration to 1923. And now we have had a problem. <laughs> no. To 23. So many people in Gothenburg think that the town was founded in 1613. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but anyhow, we have done some things, and we have um, at, at the Department of Art and Social Society have produced a book with uh, uh, articles by different scholars, mainly scholars, on different uh, aspects of the history of Gothenburg, uh, published in Sweden, just recently published. I am also and I was one of the members of the uh, editorial committee. So you are still reflecting on what will, will, will come next in the yeah, next uh, 400 years. Yeah, and uh, it's an interesting question, it's very complex, but yes, um, of course it is. It's difficult to, the historians have a way of, of thinking that it's not always uh, so easy to accommodate to what we do discuss. It. As a geologist, and less to work with the sort of urban uh, planner thing. I try to involve that more in the process. Still, the book is interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, we look forward to look at the book. Yeah. yeah. In the meanwhile, and then I have to go to the police station <laughs> <laughs> for my passport. This was Pescara in, in ancient times. So, as you can see, it was a very small village on the river. And it was a fortress fortification with... Um, actually, we are here with the, with the school right now. As you can see, it was a marshland with, with water. And anyway, the, the fortification was demolished totally, completely. 
to allow the city to expand. It, it was originally a military camp from the Roman Empire because it was a, the eastern harbor for Rome to the Adriatic um, maritime traffics. It was um, beautiful according. We have another. Abbiamo un'altra molto bella della fortezza. Vi ricordate qual è? Gli storici si pronunciano. Chi sono gli storici? Vi ricordate qual è la, la, la mappa quella più, più bella della fortezza? No? This is during the World War, I told you yesterday, the bombing, the bombing. Yeah. No, 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 vedo la, forse nel libro. No. Uh, I, I will. Um, it's how wide is the little I wide. It's five, um, 50 meters, about yeah. 50 meters. Because the, the, the little yurta is very wide. Mm. I think it's like 1,000 meters. It's a big difficulty. <coughs> it's more difficult to connect to the side. Uh -huh. so, yes, of course. So you need this telepheric. Not the aerial uh, yeah, I wire. Know, they had that idea. I don't <laughs> oh, this one. Okay. And this is uh, still existing. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 this, this part is the ancient tissue of the city, very small part of, of the city. And I, I will bring you to visit to visit this part of the city, which was uh, which is still is the, the let's say the uh, restaurant district of the city, uh, mm -hmm. bars and and restaurants for the nightlife. But now it's no more so so strong because. As, I, as you as you see as you saw yesterday, uh, it's more in the northern part of the city now, the Movida. Okay, this one I was looking for, but it, this was a project. Jakarta. If I show a, a plan from the 17th century of, of Antalya, as well as in the, the plan mm -hmm. and they had a lot of temples as Gothenburg. And in Gothenburg, they have covered several temples. So they are talking about opening. <coughs> they are covered as if kind of bridges, and this is not called covering them. But they are talking about opening. In uh, Jakarta, these towns uh, constitute a big problem because no days in maintenance. So they are like cloaks. They are? It is a, a cloaca. Cloaca. Yeah. yeah. And uh, people live very close to them and even mm. big things constructed out in the river. And I know the uh, anthropologist has been working in that area. This is the thriving area with uh, new uh, innovative uh, entrepreneurs and things, but it's a horrible environment. And 
each year they are in serious problems and it is disgusting because it's like a problem. Mm. So that is a big problem. So they must start with the uh, municipality cleaning, but there is still nothing on that. Mm -hmm. so we are fortunate enough that we are cleaning with the accounts because we have descriptions from the century and they assemble what <laughs> we know today from Jakarta. So if you have panels in the car, you must sustain and maintain them continuously. That is a very important thing. They are not self administered They must be uh, kept in order. So, time to go for me. <laughs> So, um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, no, thank you again, Per.